Hello, I'm Cameron, a rising senior studying computer science at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Today, I'm presenting on my work towards building a pipeline for creating interactive Amplicon sequencing data visualizations. Thank you to my mentors, Dr. Kirill Grigorov and Alexis Torres for making this work possible. For a brief outline of the presentation, first I'll give an overview of my goals when starting this project. Then I'll move to discuss current work on the visualizations and future work to be done after the internship period. Finally, I'll have a live demo and questions as time permits. First, let's just talk the, discuss the goals of the project. For those unfamiliar, the Gene Lab Visualization Portal is part of NASA's Open Science and Open Data Initiatives. Scientists and the community can openly browse data from space flights and experiments through the Open Science Data Repository, but researchers are on their own for deriving insights from data. The Gene Lab Visualization Portal helps to bridge this gap, allowing researchers to easily select one or more DNA microarray or DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing data sets for visualization and exploration. My goal for this project is to expand the Gene Lab portal by adding support for Amplicon sequencing visualizations. In the current data processing pipeline, after an OSDR data set is downloaded and processed, a script written in the R programming language and created by Alexis Torres is run to generate graphs and visualizations. These graphs are stored in the user's computer and explored as regular images. While a useful tool, these static images don't really allow for tweaks or insights to explore the data and are difficult to share from a local computer to the wider open science community. By converting these graphs from the R native ggplot format to the Plotly graphing framework, we can make these visualizations more interactive and, graphs, and move graphs easily between R, Python, and JavaScript. For this project, I'll be demonstrating this functionality through the use of a prototype web server hosting these interactive graphs. When you select a data set in the Gene Lab visualization portal, you can see each graph rendered in a separate tile that can be interacted with and moved around. These graphs seen here are HTML elements rendered inside tiles using the Plotly graphing library. By building a prototype web server that mimics the Gene Lab tech stack, visualizations can be developed locally in a simpler multi-page application without the tiles and later ported easily to the full visualization portal. Now that we see the goal of the project, let's move into current work and application design. I'll keep this section a little shorter to make more time for the demo, but hopefully this should give a good understanding of how the web application will look at and how it's all laid out. First off, the, Ampl the Amplicon sequencing data visualizer is built as a prototype web server with single pages for graphs that will be later integrated into the tile-based gene lab portal. On the side here, you can see one of these graphs that would appear in the prototype application and on the final gene lab portal. The application layout and hyperlink-based navigation is purely to aid development, while the visualizations, the graph modifying UI elements, and the software pipeline behind the scenes will be ported to the live gene lab portal. To make this porting process easier, the prototype web server uses the same technologies as the website and researchers making these visualizations do. That's R for generating graphs, Python to run the server backend, and HTML plus JavaScript for the front end rendered in your browser. When you first visit the website, you'll see a menu to select an OSDR dataset to download. This page mimics the assay section, assay selection table in the Gene Lab portal. While this feature is not currently integrated with the rest of the application due to limitations in the Gene Lab Open API, a data set will still be downloaded for users who want to run the server locally and manually run the data set through the Amplicon sequencing pipeline. Next, you'll see a page indicated by the green rectangle where you can select a graph to interact with. This page mimics the tile-based view, just separate it out onto multiple static pages instead of one page with tiles. Finally, as indicated by the orange rectangle, you can see clicking on a, on a graph name will send you to the actual visualization, like the one you saw on the previous page. To understand a little more what's going on behind the scenes, let's look at how data flows through the web application. First, a slightly modified version of Alexis's R script is run to generate the initial graphs. 
These graphs are easily generated by their own function, which each return a ggplot graph object. ggplot, for those who don't know, is a graphing framework that's very expressive and native to the R programming language. To allow for interaction with the Django web server, these R functions are wrapped in Python functions, which can be called by the server to request graphs with different modifications and adjustments. For a little more vocabulary defining, Django is a web framework that makes it very easy to host your own applications. And RPy2 is a Python framework that allows us to call R functions from our Python code. This method allows for ease of use and flexibility, as anyone looking to modify a visualization only needs to change one function, and anyone looking to add a visualization can either add an R function generating a ggplot visualization or a Python function generating a plotly visualization. Next, the wrapper transforms the ggplot graph into a plotly graph. Plotly is a unique graphing framework in that it supports many programming languages and can be stored in the universal JSON object format. This means a graph JSON generated by the web server and sent to a client can be modified in the browser through JavaScript code, even if it was originally generated in the R programming language or the Python programming language. However, for alterations to a graph that require an understanding of the data or even a complete redraw of the graph, we need to use a, a Django form to request that the server generate these changes for us. The front end will send this form to the web server. We'll then ask the wrapper to generate these graphs with the requested changes and finally serve the visualizations to the user, just like the original graph. I understand this is a lot of information, and for those unfamiliar with web development, this might not all be understandable, but hopefully as I'm showing the live demo, it'll be a lot clearer. Now, before we see the visualizer in action, let's look at next steps for the project and what needs to be improved. At this point, really the only essential next step is to integrate this work with the current Gene Lab visualization portal. Once ported, this pipeline will enable researchers to view amplicon sequencing data in the portal, just like any other assay type currently supported. For future projects and beyond, I have a few suggestions of changes and improvements. The bulk of this project was focused on improving the interactability of these graphs while adding minimal styling, so it could be very beneficial to add styling that matches the current Gene Lab Portal's design language. Not only that, but visualizations were initially designed to be presented in a PNG format. Now that graphs can be interacted to show more information, it could be beneficial to make graphs more readable by moving this information from access labels to operations like a mouse hover over data points. With this pipeline, it would also be relatively simple to modify the UI, add additional graphs, or even adapt this pipeline to an entirely different assay type. As a final note, when new graphs are requested by the browser, the entire page needs to be reloaded. Changing this to a post operation and removing the need for refresh could make the experience much more enjoyable for the user. All right, let's finally get into the live demo. Because this website will not be up after this presentation, I've included some slides of screenshots to illustrate what the website is like to navigate. Let's take a look. All right. Right now, behind the scenes, the graphs are being loaded by the script. And now we can see a selection table with different graphs. Currently, right now, you can see there are one, two, three, four, five, six different supported graph types. And within these are multiple selection panels, which allow us to toggle between graphs. Let's take a look at hierarchical clustering. So at the top bar, first, you can see options that are rendered in the browser. These options are usually simpler, simpler and don't rely on knowledge of the underlying data. For example, toggling showing grid lines on and off and toggling the opacity. For operations that are a little more complex, we have this drop-down menu right here. You can see by changing the selection from do not use labels for markers to use labels for markers, we can then send a request to the server to regenerate the plot. And now we can see our plot with the updated labels. While this may not be the previous visualization, as it was originally intended for a blank PNG format, I'm sure this could be later adapted in the future to be an extendable format for allowing different visualizations. Let's take a look at a different type.
with the rarefaction curve, you can see there is an option for there. Are, there are no options for changing uh, behind the scenes. However, this is a great opportunity to show the advantages of Plotly. So by hovering over the graph, we can see introspection on individual data points, something not possible with a PNG format. And on the right, where we have different groups, we can toggle on and off to make it easier to see different data. All right, I'll end my presentation there. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, and I'm very open to questions now, or if anyone would like to see any other features of the page, I'd be happy to share. Thank you. Awesome, great job, Cam. I see Sanjoy has a question. Cameron, that was super cool. I love to seeing the, the web demo in action. Thank you. What's what's slowing me down from implementing these visualizations in my own work is that technology moves so fast. So while we can you can build a website that looks good today, next year or two years down the road, like the technology behind it is going to be obsolete, which means that you know there's a lot of work that needs to happen continuously to keep everything up to date all the time. And as a, as an individual scientist, I just don't have the bandwidth to keep these technologies updated to ensure that, you know, 10 years down the road, the, the website I built to visualize a, you know, data from a paper I wrote a long time ago is still live and active and everything. Do you have a recommendation of how we can like tackle this, this quick technology change when, when we don't have the resources of a team to, to uh, update those, those, those programs? That's a hard question. It's something I've struggled with too in my own development. I know it's very hard even looking a years back and trying to get some piece of code running that generated this beautiful visualization working. Um, I know I'm sure a lot of people in the biological community are, fam are familiar with virtual environments, whether that be Python's built-in virtual environment, Conda environments, or even Docker containers. But I think really just any form of repeatable containers are kind of the only real powerful tool I found to combat this. Um, for example, for this visualization portal I have right now, I have a repeatable Conda environment that's laid out in the repository. Um, while this doesn't guarantee that it'll work on any computer anywhere, in fact, I'd say this even has the current uh, the current limitation that this server will not run on ARM computers because some of the under an, an ARM computer like an would be similar to an M1 MacBook, while a traditional x86 would be like the typical PC I'm running this on. Um, but even this, this portal right now has that limitation. So if the future moved and x86 was dumped as a platform, um, then this wouldn't be supported. So no, I haven't quite found a, like a, a great universal solution, um, but I find just documenting my work a lot, taking screenshots where I can to preserve it and using virtual environments to try and make it as repeatable as possible. It's really helped me.